If you're looking for success in the vacation rental industry, Heather Bayer and the team at CottageBlogger.com are here to show you that it's entirely within reach. Welcome to Vacation Rental Success, the show that features interviews with industry experts, successful vacation rental owners, and more, all geared toward helping you make it happen. Here's your host, Heather Bayer. Well, hello again. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer, and I'm really delighted to be back with you again today for a solo episode. I know how much you enjoy the interviews I do with so many other guests, but sometimes it's great to get back to basics and to look at some of the operational things that we all experience in our businesses. And although I do talk about these things a little to some of the guests that, that I have on the podcast, when I'm talking to owners and other property managers, sometimes I just want to share some of my experiences. And this is particularly the case as we get into, you know, into the midst of our summer, because we hear so much from our guests about what they like, what they don't like, what irritates them what drives them to distraction even, and, you know, sometimes what constitutes an emergency. For example, we've just had a, an owner contact us to say that they heard from their current guests that the dishwasher wasn't working properly. And after a, a, a few attempts to, to get it going again, it was finally decided that this, this dishwasher had quit, they needed an appliance repair person to go out and check it out. Now, the current guests are okay. They're quite happy. There's only four or five of them. They're quite happy to continue for the next 18 hours or so and and do their own dishes. Um, You know, as as we all find, some of our guests are far more tolerant than others. As is the case in cottage country, it's not really easy to find an appliance repair person at the drop of a hat. And this owner had been out and she she and her property manager have been looking for someone to come in and take a look at this machine. And I'm recording this on a Friday and they found somebody, an emergency uh, appliance repair company that will come out and look at the mach- machine next Wednesday. Now that's as far as, you know, emergency response goes in in our area you know emergency response means somebody's going to come out in the next five days to seven days and that's pretty good so we've let the guests that are coming in tomorrow know that they're unlikely to have a dishwasher working dishwasher by until next wednesday and they are not happy there's six adults and three teenage children in the group and we have heard from them that they consider this to be a an extreme emergency that they're going to be on vacation without a dishwasher. Now, to some extent, I really can understand this. I know when when my husband and I go away in our RV, we don't have a dishwasher. And we're used to having one, even just even with just the two of us. The thought of having nine people in a house uh, eating maybe two meals a day, if not more, and not having the convenience of a machine that's going to take all those dirty dishes and spit out the clean ones two hours later, I I can understand that they are upset. I don't quite see it as the huge emergency they're making it out to be, but that is their perspective and they're guests and they're on vacation. So we, we have to do what we can. And, you know, kudos to the owner. She, she said, okay, if I can't get a repairman out till Wednesday, I'm getting a new dishwasher. Um, That's not going to be delivered, unfortunately, till Monday. So they do have from four o'clock tomorrow afternoon, which is Saturday through through to Monday, to actually cope without a dishwasher. And I'm hoping that they might utilize the three teenagers they have in their group, maybe teach them how to wash up because there's, there's a good possibility they've never done this in their lives. And just add it to the quirkiness of going on a cottage vacation. How would you handle that? Do you think the owner is doing is doing the right thing? Do you think she could have done anything else? I mean, in the meantime, she's also providing them with paper plates and paper cutlery for them to use 
uh, in the in the interim. So quite honestly, I think we've she's done as much as she possibly can. Uh, it's not physically possible to get anything out there quicker. We're in an e extremely rural area, and they are 35 kilometers from the nearest town that uh, that has any sort of appliance store. And and these places just they they don't they don't deliver uh, at the drop of a hat. And and this owner is in the U.S. She's having to rely on her local property manager to make all these arrangements. It's just not something that they normally do. Uh, you know, it's the nature of our business up in this area that uh, we just hope things go good from from day to day, from week to week, and month to month because of it, it's just tough to find anybody to do anything. So anyway, that's that's just one example of, of things that are happening at the moment. And it really got me thinking about what what can happen to affect a negative review. Even if everything about the place is fantastic, is it just one or two things that can go wrong? And how can you deal with them when that thing happens? But I just wanted to be really specific for this episode and just talk about one 30 minute period during your rental when things can happen or some sort of neglect of something can cause your guests to be unhappy for their entire time or at least unhappy enough to write something negative or to reduce a five-star review to a four or even, even a three or lower perhaps. And we're talking today about the 10 surefire ways to upset your guests at check-in time. Because that is that, that time is so important when your guests arrive. We certainly know this in our company because every Saturday at four o'clock, we've got anywhere in the summer between 100 and 150 or 160 families going into properties. And we sit there and cross our fingers and hope hope for the best at that time because we want everybody to arrive to have everything meet their expectations have all that anticipation rewarded by the reality of of the place that they've been looking forward to i like to look at it like there's a magic that accompanies an arrival at a vacation rental you know it's the culmination of months sometimes years of planning for some people. And all your guests have had to go on in that time is the 20 to 30 photos on a listing and the description. Now, I know that because I go to a dozen or so vacation rentals every year. And I've just booked one in, uh, in Florence. That really got me thinking about, you know, is this, is this going to be, is this going to be right? Have I done the right thing? And I end up and I know a lot of people do this. They end up second guessing. You know, have I, I've, I've made this decision. I've paid my money. And then I, you start looking at other properties. Is there something better out there? Have I made the, the right choice? Are my family going to be upset with me if there's something about it I don't like? So if you just imagine that this arrival, the whole family's there. They've all arrived. Everybody's excited. They're all anticipating so much. The listing or the website with the photos have set all their expectations. The onus is on the owner, the property manager, the agency, whoever is dealing with this to make that arrival go really, really smoothly. Because if it doesn't, there's not just one disappointed person. There is a whole group of disappointed people. And that's what gives rise to negative reviews and getting unhappy people on the phone at the start of their vacation, which is definitely not something you want. So I've sort of compiled a list, which I've called my 10 surefire ways to ups upset your guests at check-in time. And this list has really come from a lot of my own experiences. It's come from things that I hear from our guests when they get to uh, some of our properties. And, and those I've heard from friends, relatives, colleagues, other people who I went, because so often when I talk to them and I say, did you enjoy your stay? I always ask that question. What was your first impression? What made it so good for you? Was it the sound or the smell or the, the, the feel of it? Did everything go smoothly? 
It's when things don't go smoothly that you've got a problem. Let me talk through these 10 ways to upset your guests at check-in time. And then maybe you can add in your own in the show notes and let me know if I've missed anything out. So let's kick off with number one. And that's the messy exterior, the overgrown driveway or an impression of neglect. And I can hear you say, oh, gosh, no, I, yeah, you drive at my place and everything is spotless. It's a beautiful place. But how far out are you looking? A couple of weeks ago, in fact, I went out to a, a new property, somebody who was interested in renting their property for the first time. And I often don't get any photos before I get to go and do these viewings. So I drove out to this place and I, I, I had a good idea where it was. It was, uh, it was on a, a really nice stretch of, um, of what's called the Trent River. And I drove in, I followed the directions, drove in on this gar- gr- driveway and it, it was a gated, you, you went through a gated road and I thought, well, this is nice. This, this feels good. You know, there's, there's a gate. Well, the, the gate was open, but it, it, it just felt like there was a nice driveway. And I, and I thought, well, wow, this looks promising. There should be something good at the end of it. There wasn't really a house at the end of the driveway. Um, there, was a, there was a huge steel hut and then a great expanse of um, grassed area or lawn. And there were a couple of properties sort of dotted around this grassed area. So there was no real way of sh- telling which property was which and which one I was meant to be going to because there was there was no numbers. So I, I picked one at random and I, I fortunately it was the right one because when I walked to it, somebody came to the door to greet me. But what I noticed as I got to the door is that the paving slabs were broken and cracked. There was vegetation coming up through the paving slabs. And then I went into the house, which was gorgeous. It was absolutely lovely inside. But I could not get out of my mind this arrival to this house, which didn't have any promise at all until I actually walked in the door. And and the owner kept saying, oh, I bet you're surprised at what, what it looks like inside after you've seen the outside. <laughs> and I said, yeah, actually, I am. Why aren't you looking after the outside? And they said that, you know, they, they were just they just had too much, too much time. Um, too much time spent on the inside. They hadn't really considered the outside. To, to which my reply was, you have to give as much attention to the outside as you're giving the inside. Because if you ruin your guests' anticipation right at that point when they arrive and, and disappointment starts to set in, it can take a lot to get that back up again. A messy exterior, overgrown driveway, any impression of neglect is going to contribute possibly to a negative review. So still on that same sat that same area outside, let's have a look at the other things that are also contributory. A dirty front door, an unpolished doorknob, stained siding, peeling paintwork, and maybe having a welcome mat, but there's grass growing through it, that they all contribute to this feeling of, oh my goodness, I think we've made a big mistake. And then you start looking around at the other, the rest of the group that's arrived with you. And they're all looking around thinking, oh, what have we got into? Maybe I can see some nice waterfront, but is the neglect from the outside going to be followed up inside? So even if they then walk in the door and it's, it's, it's different and welcoming and lovely, you just can't get that first impression out of your mind. Uh, some years ago, we went to Eleuthera and I remember leaving the airport and it was a new place. We'd never been there. It was very exciting. And we were we were hugely anticipatory of this trip. And we followed the instructions and, and it, the, the directions did say you'd come off onto a pothole road and to take it easy. We were driving along this pothole road. It was it was worse than we had anticipated. And looking to the side of the road as there were we were driving past uh, the driveways to other properties and some of them were clearly rentals and the driveways looked really neglected and it just wasn't too nice at all then when we we went down another half a kilometer or so and we got to our place and we saw a, a beautiful sign outside for the property 
and we went into the driveway and it was gorgeous. It was so beautiful. The gardens were lovely. There were hummingbirds all over the place. There were flowers and shrubs and it was so colourful. That was the best first impression ever. However, I'll continue with this story of this property in Eleuthera because unfortunately we were a little bit let down um, later in this 30 minutes of check-in. Because once your guests have arrived at the property, the next thing they want to do is access it and they want it quickly. They don't want to be messing around, fiddling with keys in locks or trying to get a code in because and they can't remember what the code is or they've got instructions as to where a key has been left and it's not there. And that you get this this real, oh my goodness, what, what, what are we going to do next when you can't get into a property? Panic actually does set in, and particularly if you're, if you're in another country. And this is what happened in the Eleuthera, pro- in, in the Eleuthera property. You know, we'd, we'd come down this gorgeous driveway and it's beautiful flowers and it was, we were so excited and we piled out of the car. Um, we were with Mike and Andrea at the time. Mike and Andrea sort of disappeared around to the side to go and look at the, the beachfront side and I recalled from the instructions I'd been sent that the key was under a frog just outside the front door. Now, try as, we, try as I did, I could not find this frog. There was nothing outside the front door. There was, there was a rock or two. We lifted those rocks and there was nothing under them. And I'm immediately in panic mode. What are we going to do? It's, sort of, it's late. It's, it's six o'clock in the evening. There's nobody else here. We don't know if our phones are going to work. We've just come through the local town and just about everything was was just shutting up for the day. So it really was into initial panic mode until Mike came back. He wasn't as panicky as me. And and he found this uh, stone frog at the bottom of the steps leading up to uh, leading up to the front door. And there was the key underneath the stone frog. But to me, that stone frog should have been outside the front door, just like it was advertised and as we were told in the pre-arrival instructions. So I wasn't looking for it at the bottom of the steps. I was looking for it outside the front door. That first excitement at coming in the driveway and seeing everything was so lovely was taken away by this mild panic. Say mild panic? Mike would say it was something a little bit more than that. But yeah, it was taken away by that panic of of thinking that we we couldn't get in. And there we were, the four of us, with a five month old baby who was um you know, just got off an aeroplane and clearly ready for feeding, changing, etc. And what had been running through my mind was what do we do now? Those access issues, it could be the key code doesn't work. The key not the key is not where it should be. Um, we had we had one um, property owner who used to leave his key with a neighbour, and he said, "Well, that's all right. My neighbour's always there. Neighbour's always there um, for for people who are checking in, until the guests arrived two hours late because they'd been held up on on the uh, on the highway due to an accident." And so they arrive, they're hot, they're tired, there's six of them, they, they just want to get in and start to relax. So they go next door for the key to find a note from the neighbour to say, looks like, looks like you're, not, you're, you're not arriving, so we've popped out for an hour. Um, we'll be back at eight o'clock. Um, that was not a good start to their vacation. R- really have a think about your access uh, access to your property? Is it easy? Can your guests really access the property quickly and without any fuss whatsoever? Because the moment you put some sort of obstacle between them getting in the house and standing on the doorway, you've got a problem on your hands. And people don't soon forget that they started their vacation with panic. So now they've opened the door. Now, this is where it gets interesting because if you've got them that far and 
their first impression is five star because the place looks fantastic from the outside. It's just what they expected. They've been able to get in. Now you can really screw it up. I have a really keen sense of smell. Um, my husband would agree with that because we have this constant argument about the milk. You know, I'll get the milk out and say, ah, that's off. No, it's not, he says. That's not off at all. There is nothing wrong with the milk. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I can smell it. It smells bad. No, it doesn't. And he makes me a cup of tea and I uh, put the mug to my lips and I can smell the milk is off. And he doesn't smell anything. But I have a very keen sense of smell and a lot of people do. So smell matters. The way your place smells really, really matters. You don't notice it. If you've been in, if you've been in your property a long time, you don't know what it smells like. Because you have to go out, you have to get out into the fresh air and you have to walk into it afresh with, I don't know, I don't know what you call it when it's not a clear palate, that's for taste, but whatever a clear palate for a nose is. So you've got to walk in to your property with a, yeah, a nose palate, fresh nose palate, we'll call it. Because if this smells of food, you know, if you're, if you're, the guests who left that morning had a fried breakfast, mm -mm or they were cooking curry the night before, you've got an issue there. And that needs to be dealt with somehow. Um, one other, th the other thing that I, I find offensive is pungent air fresheners. Those plugins, please don't use them. Don't, don't, don't use them. Because for anybody with a really keen sense of smell, then they are going to find those, um, the plug-in air fresheners offensive. Another thing that's pretty offensive is the Lysol type disinfectant. And I had this argument with somebody, a, a cleaner, in fact, who said, well, of course, I'm going to use, I've got to use strong disinfectant because people will smell it and it'll feel, and it'll smell fresh and clean. No, it doesn't. It smells like a public washroom. I had this discussion with my cleaner. Now, please don't leave the blue stuff in the toilet when you have finished cleaning. And she says, well, it'll, it's, go, it's going to show the guests that it's clean. Well, no, nice, clean, fresh water in a toilet shows that it's clean. So flush it away because that pungent odor can permeate the entire place and it doesn't smell fresh. You may think it smells clean. It smells like it has been cleaned. But to, to some people, it's, it's, it's an unpleasant odor. And what you want in the place is really sort of no odor at all. You want it to feel fresh, that you walk in and it's just like there's a nothing odor. Musty smells if, if you're in a humid uh, climate and, and you've got a lot of wood and maybe concrete that sweats. I know places up here have basements and if they've got concrete floors, those floors can sweat. And I know even my own house, in uh, our basement where our office is, the last few weeks, it's been so wet, so damp. I've, I've walked down into the basement, into the office in the morning, and it's like, yuck, this is so vile. It's just because it smells damp. Definitely use humidifiers or anything you can possibly do to take out any musty smell because people associate musty with mildew. And, and they will complain. But when you get a complaint from somebody that says your place smells of mildew, they mean it smells musty. I was, uh, I was looking at some uh, posts on the, either the hosting journey or say no to VRBO yesterday. And uh, an owner had had a review about her place. In fact, people left because they said they, 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 they walked in and it smelt musty and mildewed so they walk straight out again um and and she was saying you know but it's an it's an old property and old properties have an odor in fact every property has its own odor you've just got to figure out what that is and whether you can do something about it by you know ensuring that windows are left open prior to your guests coming or just doing something to make it Less odorful, I guess, which may not always be easy. But certainly pay attention to the smell because if that if place smells when people walk in,
that's it's not something that will will go away so the next one is paying attention to temperature some years ago we had we had an owner who uh, wanted to rent his property out in the winter but because it would be rented so sporadically you know we tend to go weekend to weekend and not have people in there and he said well i'm i'm putting the i'm going to have the thermostat set to um to the sort of tick over so just over freezing and then when and then when people get in they can just turn the thermostat up and it'll be it'll be warm in about an hour and we said no that's that that is completely unacceptable when somebody goes into a property in winter they want to get out of their car they're going to get out of the nice warm car into the cold get in get to the doorway hopefully have easy access inside the property and when they open it they're going to be enveloped in warmth and that is the start of a cozy winter vacation it's not a cozy winter vacation if you've got to keep your coat on for the first hour and rub your hands and blow on your hands and, and and until the place warms up that's not acceptable and the same goes for, for you know in, in the heat and i know that many people uh, rent their properties in hot countries or or places where it's uh, it's really really hot in the summer now you don't necessarily have to set your air conditioner so that when they walk in, they feel like they're walking into a freezer. I mean, some, that's something I hate because I'm, I'm not a fan of air conditioning. But as long as the property feels cool when they walk in, if they've just come from the airport, they're probably, you know, they've been on the aeroplane, they've got off, they've gone through immigration maybe, picked up their bags, found their vehicle, gone shopping, all those things, they're going to be hot and sticky when they arrive. So they want to walk in to a cool environment and if they don't they're not going to be happy because the first thing they start doing is looking around and going well well where's the aircon how how do I how do I get this how do I get this temperature down it's too hot and it's some some actually something that we hear from from our guests throughout the summer that it's too hot complaint because a lot of our properties actually don't have air conditioning so it makes it important that somebody has been into the property just before the guests arrive or at least the sort of the half an hour before the guests arrive to make sure that the the, the, the heat is turned up in the winter it's turned it's the, the air cons on in the summer the fans are perhaps turned on and the place looks gen generally welcoming one thing i hadn't uh, i hadn't considered um, it just just came to mind when i'm going through this list is um is lighting that uh, that when if, if your guests are arriving in winter in the dark to make sure that there are lights on and that they're not fumbling in the dark for light switches because they don't know where they are. You know, it's, it's just common sense to keep lights on for them. So an outside light and uh, certainly a couple of inside lights. When we have people come to our cottage in the winter, they walk in the door. We have, uh, they walk in the door to a light filled property. And when I say light filled, it's all ambient lighting and the propane fireplace is going and there's music playing and it, it really is a welcoming atmosphere for them. So the next way of upsetting your guests at check-in time is having no welcome packet at all for them. It's just expecting them to walk in, know where everything is, know what they have to do and just leave them to it. I mean, even, you know, now, even when I go into a hotel room, one of the things that I tend to do when I arrive is have a look around to see if if there is a some, something that tells me about room service. Um, is there a laundry? Is there a swimming pool? Is there a gym? What, as soon as I've got sort of settled and I've made myself a cup of coffee, then I'm usually looking around to find out a little bit more about the place I'm staying. Well, that's in a hotel room. So, in a vacation rental, you definitely need to be doing that and and more. The argument is that people don't read, so there's no real reason to offer them much in the way of written material. But at least people want an acknowledgement that they were expected, that they, they are, in fact, welcome. And one of the ways of, of, one of the simple ways of doing it is having a chalkboard with their names on it. 
that says, hi, Pete and Mary and kids and dog, uh, welcome. I mean, we, we do a welcome letter for each one of our guests. And the welcome letter says, you know, has, has their full names. It, it's, it doesn't vary from guest to guest, but it's, it's, a, it's a handwritten note that makes them feel that they're actually personally welcome. And what I like to add on each welcome note is, is something very personal to that group. And it could be something, something that I picked up from an email uh, or a phone call that we've had. And it could be, you know, hope Nancy enjoys her birthday or your boys are interested in fishing. So we put some fishing tackle and some fishing rods in the garage. Yeah, something, something that's personal to that group. And it's amazing how far that gesture goes to make people feel that they are really genuinely welcome. So, you know, your, your welcome could be a gift. It could be, a, we, we leave a jar of honey, local honey for our guests. It could be a letter, personal letter, the welcome book with information about the property or, you know, something like the Your Welcome tablet, which a lot of people are using now and I'm going to be using in my own property very shortly. But if you have no welcome packet at all, nothing, then it won't be very long before your guests start wondering how they can get in touch with you to let you know that they're disappointed. So next is overdone show rounds. This is where if you meet your guests, it's really important that you respect the fact that from the moment they step in the door, they're on their vacation time. And if you spend even more than 10 or 15 minutes of that time, that is time that they don't want to be with you. That They don't want to spend being shown how the shower turns on or the quirks of a kettle. They'll find those things out on their own or they'll find it from a welcome book. But they don't want to, want to waste their precious vacation time talking to you. Just think about it like that. You know, you're on vacation from the moment you step foot in that door. It's their downtime and everything they do should be driven by what they want to do, not what you want to deliver to them. So keep your show rounds down to 10 minutes, 15 minutes at absolute max. And if you can do it in two or three minutes and skip out of the door, that's even better. About 15 years ago, um, we came across from England with, with a large group. There were about 10 of us and, and we'd had a long flight and then we had to pick up our, uh, our hire cars and then go shopping and eventually arrived at this, this beautiful place around nine o'clock at night. And the owner was there at 11 o'clock, two hours later. And granted, it was a large place, had an indoor swimming pool and all, all the bells and whistles. But at the end of this, we knew where every light switch was. We knew where every socket was. We had been shown every little post-it note that was stuck to the wall telling us what we could and couldn't do. He had opened every cupboard to show us where things were. And he had shown us every single bedroom and almost expected as we were going from bedroom to bedroom for us to decide who was going to sleep in, in each one. And he would stand there until one of us would say, oh, OK, this will be mine then. It was one of my first experiences of going to a vacation rental with, with a larger group and, and doing it um, um, overseas. So arriving tired. And, you know, all we wanted to do was open that first beer and sit down and talk about the trip and, and then all go to all tumble into our respective rooms and go to sleep. It wasn't a good start to that vacation. So that's, that's just probably an extreme example. But if you are one who likes, to, and we do, we, I know we love it when people walk into our places and they're, 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 they're all ecstatic and go, oh, fantastic. This is so fantastic. This is so beautiful. We love to hear that. It makes us feel good. But don't hang around until they start to think, oh, I wish she would go. Y you are then getting into negative review territory. So the next one is missing or broken amenities. And this could be anything from a missing light bulb to the smoke alarm hanging off the ceiling with the battery missing, to maybe a broken appliance or, or even a feature such as a hot tub or sauna not working correctly. Or, of course, 
a dishwasher not working. Um, we don't want missing and broken amenities when we arrive. We want everything to be working perfectly. And if it's not, then we should have been informed beforehand, which is why we were out telling the guests coming into this particular property tomorrow that the dishwasher is not working. We want to make sure that our guests don't have any surprises. Um, one of the one of the issues we come across a lot is um, barbecue propane, where the caretaker has perhaps not checked on the propane levels after the previous guests have finished uh, ha have checked out. And then we find that the incoming guests are calling us at eight o'clock at night saying, well, we've arrived and we've just started to cook our bar, you know, to cook all our meat on the barbecue and the propane's run out and there's no spare. So where do we go to refill with propane? And then we have to say, well, there's no nothing open at this time of night. Fortunately, that is essentially a thing of the past for our company because we have some we, we have some specific standards that our owners must meet now. And one of them is that they always have a full spare of propane available as well as the one that's on the barbecue. But things happen, you know, things get forgotten. Uh, that, that's where difficulties and problems arise. So one way of dealing with this, that the first thing that a caretaker does when they arrive at a property to do a changeover is go through all the amenities, turn off all, t turn on and off all the lights so you can change any light bulbs, check every single appliance to make sure it's working correctly, check all the things that could be missing like for us, it's oars or paddles from a canoe or oars from a rowboat. Check it to make sure there's there's plenty of wine glasses and all these things. It's it's check, 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 check. All you need is a checklist for your caretaker so that they can then they can go in. They can look at all these things and uh, right at the very beginning of the changeover so that if there is something broken or missing, it can be dealt with. Or at least you can get in touch with the guests who are on their way just to give them due notice that something's up, something was missing, something was broken during the last rental and you're dealing with it and it's going to be replaced. So they don't get any surprises when they get there. The last but one is, is one of my little bugbears and that is difficulty logging into the internet. Because whenever I go to a vacation rental, it's a first, you know I, I walk in the door and it's almost the first thing. I, I, I really struggle with this one because I am so tied to my technology. And when I'm on vacation, I do try and unplug a little. If I've been on a long flight and, and it's been an hour or two from the airport and I haven't had um, connection with the office or with my family, then the first thing I get into I, I want when I get into the property, is to log into the internet. And if that is difficult, then I'm I'm just not a happy bunny at all. That one of the last things that should be done as your caretaker or uh, cleaner backs out of the cottage is just, just to check that the internet is working, that everything is okay, that the password's available and it's not, it's not got lost or uh, is missing from the welcome book. And then last but not least, this is something that I came across at the very early stages when I started doing this business around 20 years ago and been to quite a few rentals and there was always this lengthy list of rules. That, that was sort of what was expected and tolerated in the early days of vacation rental. You know, somebody was using your place, therefore they had to follow your rules of the house. Um, it's... But for me, it's a personal thing. When I go to a vacation rental and I have paid a lot of money for it, I don't want people telling me, I don't want the owners telling me what I cannot do and what I must do because that can be couched in much nicer language to encourage me as a paying guest to, to comply with everything that the owner wants. I hope that makes sense and it, it doesn't, it doesn't, make me come across as arrogant but but basically I, I just hate seeing rules of the house or rules of the cottage maybe this is because I went to boarding school and I lived with rules for 
for many of my formative years. You know, you can't do this. You can't, you must do that. And I rebelled for some time after I left school. So maybe I'm still rebelling now. But there is a way of doing it. You call your property guide whatever you want. Uh, you know, most of us will call it a welcome book or a welcome guide. For our cottage owners, we ask them to produce a cottage guide, not rules of the cottage. And when including some of the things that you really should have in that book, that, that that's going to help your guests really enjoy their vacation without getting into trouble, like, you know, t telling them how not to block the septic tank. There's ways of doing it. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to say, you know, thou shalt not flush all these things down the toilet. There's different ways of saying it that can that can have exactly the same impact, but are said in a more polite and friendly way. As I say, it's personal preference. You know, may, maybe some of you don't care if you if you go somewhere and you see a rule book. So there we are. Ten surefire ways to upset your guests at check-in time. Having a messy exterior, having a dirty front door or an unpolished doorknob or stained siding or siding or peeling paint or grass growing up through the welcome mat. If your guests have access issues, if they have difficulty in getting into the house, if there's a musty odour, a food odour, a disinfectant odour, any nasty air freshener odour, if it's too hot or too cold, depending on the time of year, just if you can't, if you haven't got the temperature right, if there's no welcome book at all, if you spend too much of your guest vacation time showing them around your wonderful place because you like hearing how much they love it, if you have missing or broken amenities, if they have difficulty logging into the internet, and finally, if you're leaving a lengthy list of rules, any one of those is a surefire way to upset your guests at check-in time and give them the ammunition they need to write a poor review because we all know how much first impressions count and it takes a long time to get rid of the impact of a poor first impression so that's it you know it's as, as I record this it's a Friday afternoon and it's around about three o'clock and in an hour's time we'll have about 50 families going into cottages so hopefully it's going to be like last week where we only had one call after after the witching hour of four o'clock. And that was simply somebody asking for directions because uh, they they, uh, they hadn't taken their directions with them. Um, so the last couple of weeks have been really, really good. We haven't been having any check-in issues. And I think it's because we've been sharing things like this that I've just talked about with our owners. Really got them thinking about that half hour from arriving at the door to, let's say, opening that first beer or pouring that first glass of wine. Whatever you can do to make that period of time really, really special for your guests, then the better you are going to be likely to have a great review from them. So I'd love to hear any more that you have. You know, if you've had an experience of going to a vacation rental and something has uh, has upset you at check-in time or upset one of your guests or you just felt that it wasn't right and it's may, maybe you've gone somewhere and you realize there was something that happened and you would not do that for your guests then let me know right uh, come to the show notes and let us know love to hear from you so that's it for this week um as this gets published we will have reached 250,000 downloads or we will be actually be quite a few over the 250,000 downloads. I can't believe we've got to over a quarter of a million downloads on the podcast. So thank you to everybody who does download these podcasts. They really are for you. If you've got comments, if you want something in, in particular, if you'd like to hear from somebody in particular if you'd like some, if you'd like me to take in a different approach, I don't know. I would love to hear from you. We're at um, episode 192 now. Um, 
only eight weeks now to our 200th episode. And I, at the moment, I'm sort of thinking about whether I should go in a different direction from 200 on or just carry on in exactly the same way as I have been going. So I do read everything you send to me. So email me at heather at cottageblogger.com if you've got a specific comment. I'd love to hear from you. So for now, thank you for listening to my voice for the last 50 odd minutes. <laughs> I thank you for your perseverance and I look forward to talking with you again next week. This episode of Vacation Rental Success is over, but don't worry, Heather will be back soon. Want more great resources? Visit cottageblogger.com for tips, tricks, downloads, and strategies to help you achieve profit from your vacation rental business. Oh, 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 o